Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes is given in the PDF format in the description box and also in the comment section for the benefit of mobile phone viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. These news articles are with reference to the ongoing process in the United States with respect to the impeachment of US President. According to the news article, the House of Representatives, which is one of the two houses of U.S. Parliament, which is also called as U.S. Congress, has impeached the U.S. President Donald Trump. In India, the national legislature is called as Parliament. It has two houses, that is, it is a bicameral legislature. In United States, the national legislature is called as Congress, which also has two houses. One house is called as House of Representatives, other house is called as Senate. In this context, we will be discussing the procedure to impeach the US President and we will also compare the way in which an Indian President can be impeached. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. We will be comparing the procedure for impeachment in US and in India based on a request made by one of our viewer on 16th November 2019. First, let's see the ongoing issues that initiated the impeachment against the US President, Mr. Donald Trump. See, the present US President belonged to the Republican Party, which is one of the two major parties in the United States. The other major party is the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party, it, it is the important opposition political party at present in the United States. See, the US presidential election is set to happen in the year 2020. And with respect to the Republican Party, Mr. Donald Trump is seen as the most probable candidate. Whereas in terms of Democratic Party, Mr. Joe Biden is seen as the leading candidate. It is alleged that Mr. Trump has misused his power as president against one of the probable candidates for 2020 elections, Mr. Joe Biden. So what did Mr. Trump do? See, son of Joe Biden had served on a board of a Ukrainian energy company. It is said that uh, Joe Biden, during his tenure as Vice President of United States from 2009 to 2017, has allegedly visited Ukraine to save his son from a lot of corruption charges and allegations. The right way to handle this issue would have been through legal mechanisms or formal mechanisms that are available in the United States. Whereas Mr. Trump has been criticized that he has pressurized the Ukrainian president to look into the allegations of wrongdoings by Joe Biden and also his son. And to get this activity done by the Ukrainian president, it is reported that Mr. Trump has stopped a White House meeting with the Ukrainian president. Actually, he has withheld a White House meeting with the Ukrainian president. And it is also reported that the U.S. president has offered that he will be releasing 391 million U.S. dollars as security aid to Ukraine to combat Russia-backed separatists. Would be released to Ukraine provided the job is done as required by US President Trump in an informal manner. Now this means Mr. Trump has misused the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the US elections in 2020 for the office of president. And it is also alleged that Mr. Trump has used his official position to block the investigation by U.S. Congress or U.S. Parliament or U.S. National Legislature by directing the administrative officials and administrative agencies not to comply with the National Legislature of the United States. So there are two articles of allegation against Trump. One is abuse of power and second one is the obstruction to the probe by the U.S. Congress. So therefore, the Speaker of U.S. House of Representatives has launched the impeachment process against President Trump. Now let us discuss the process of impeachment of U.S. President. See, impeachment is a provision that allows U.S. Congress to remove the President of United States. The U.S. Congress or U.S. National Legislature is similar to Indian Parliament. It has House of Representatives and the other houses, the Senate. So the impeachment process should be carried on in two chambers. Now let's see the grounds of impeachment. See under Article 2, Section 4 of United States Constitution. It mentions that President, Vice President and all civil officers of the United States 
can be removed from office if convicted for treason, bribery or high crimes and misdemeanors. Now what do we mean when we say misdemeanor? See generally criminal acts fall into two categories, felonies and misdemeanors. Felonies or offenses that may result in prison sentences of more than one year while misdemeanors they carry out uh, sentences of a period of one year or less. So this is the definition within the jurisdiction of United States. In India we have the category of cognizable offenses, non-cognizable offenses, heinous offenses, serious offenses and also petty offenses. See the impeachment process in United States it begins in the House of Representatives. Any member of House of Representatives can introduce an impeachment resolution on the grounds that are treason, bribery, high crimes and misdemeanors. Now with the present impeachment process in United States on September 24, 2019, the Speaker of House of Representatives has announced that the House of Representatives will move forward with an official impeachment inquiry against the US President. This announcement alone is enough to begin official impeachment proceedings in the United States. Once the announcement is made, six House committees continue their investigations of the President under the umbrella of impeachment inquiry. One of the important committee in this matter is the House Judiciary Committee. This committee along with the other committees will conduct an investigation into the impeachment. After investigating, the committees will report their findings to the House wherein the House Judiciary Committee can uh, recommend whether there should be impeachment and it will report an impeachment resolution with specific allegations of misconduct. Each investigating committee may report separate findings based on their investigation. Finally, an impeachment resolution would be made and this resolution will have articles of impeachment. These are nothing but charges of misconduct. For Mr. Trump, there are two charges, abuse of power and obstructing the US Congress. A voting process will happen in House of Representatives on this impeachment resolution. See, here in the voting process, it requires only a simple majority for passing this impeachment resolution. Once the impeachment resolution is passed in House of Representatives, it means the matter of impeachment is now referred to the Senate. So here we have to note that with respect to investigation, it is in the House of Representatives. With respect to trial for impeachment, it is with the Senate, the second house that is involved in the impeachment process. The news is that the House of Representatives has passed the vote on impeachment with simple majority. If you see the US House of Representatives, the strength of the House is 435. So the simple majority will be 218. We can find that the House of Representatives has majority of its members from the Democratic Party. This is one of the main reasons why the vote on impeachment is made quite easily. Now the trial for impeachment will begin in the Senate to determine whether the President is guilty or not. The House of uh, the Senate will select managers to present evidence to the Senate and it will also summon the witnesses and the Senate will also issue a writ of summons to the impeached president to appear. Then the trial will be carried out in Senate. The House managers will be playing the role of prosecution. The Senate will play the role of jury and the Chief Justice of Supreme Court of United States will act as the judge and the impeached official will be the defendant. Here the standards for evidence and conviction are up to the Senate with respect to the trial. We saw about vote of impeachment with respect to House of Representatives in United States. Now with respect to Senate, it is vote on conviction. So once the deliberation is completed in Senate, the Senate will vote on each article of impeachment separately. And here it requires two-third majority for conviction that will result in removal from the presidential office. So we know that the Senate in United States has two members from each state of US. Therefore it has 100 members. Here we can see one of the House in US National Legislature has membership which is equal membership for all states. Two members from each state. If you see Rajya Sabha in our country here the membership is not equal with respect to states. There is variation. The variation in seats in Rajya Sabha is on the basis of the population in each state. So once the Senate passes vote on conviction with two-third majority, the President stands removed from the office 
if it is not passed with two third of majority in Senate, then the president stays in the office. Here, two third of majority means it requires the support of 67 members in Senate to favor the vote of conviction. Now, it is reported that since Senate has a Republican majority to which Mr. Trump belongs, the chances of impeachment or chances of the vote of conviction getting passed in Senate is very less. Note that no United States president has been removed by this impeachment process till date from their offices. But the House of Representatives has impeached two presidents, Mr. Andrew Johnson in 1868 and Mr. Bill Clinton in 1998. And Mr. Trump has become the third president to be impeached by this House of Representatives. Earlier in 1974, former president Mr. Richard Nixon has resigned fearing the impeachment proceedings. According to the United States government, after passing the vote on conviction, the Senate may also vote on whether the convicted president stands disqualified from holding a government position again or not. However, for voting with respect to this matter, only a simple majority is required. Whereas we saw that two third majority is required for the vote on conviction. So determine the future course of the convicted president, a simple majority is enough. And according to US government, the impeachment proceedings have been challenged in the US federal court on many occasions. And it is unlikely that after impeachment by the US Congress, that there will be an appeal in the US Supreme Court. And based on various case laws in US, courts have said that the power of Congress to impeach is broad in nature and in many cases the decision of Congress is not subject to judicial review. So in the light of all the points that we have discussed, since Trump is seeking a re-election in 2020, the impeachment by the House of Representatives will be a stain on his reputation and the impeachment of the US President House of Representatives, according to some experts, they are saying that it shows the growing polarization in American politics. While it was known that Democrat majority House will pass the resolution, and it is also almost clear that the Republican majority Senate will not pass it. Based on this balance and polarity in both houses, they are saying that the people of United States and their representatives are divided on political lines. This is because in the vote of impeachment in House of Representatives, there is a clear divide on the matter between the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. Democrat Party supported the resolution on vote of impeachment, whereas Republican Party members opposed it. Now let's come to the procedure of impeachment of Indian President. Article 61 deals with the procedure for impeachment of Indian President. Article 61 Class 1 mentions the ground for which a president can be impeached. The ground is violation of the Constitution. See, the Constitution does not define what does it means by the violation of the Constitution. The impeachment process starts with a notice in writing that has to be signed by at least one-fourth of the total number of members of a particular house that is to initiate the process. And this notice should have the intention to move a resolution for the impeachment of the president. Once this notice has been given, after a period of 14 days, resolution to impeach the president can be moved in the house. And this resolution will have the proposal to prefer the charges against the president. Now, there is one difference with uh, the procedure that is in the United States. In the United States, we saw that the procedure can be initiated only in the House of Representatives. The Senate always comes second or only in the stage of prosecution or trial with respect to impeachment of US president. But in case of impeachment procedure for Indian president, the charges can be initiated by either House of Parliament, that is either Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha. Now we saw that once the notice is given in the House that initiates charges, there has to be a 14 days notice. According to the interpretation by Mr. Lakshmikanth in his book Indian Polity, this 14 days notice is to be given to the President of India so that the impeachment resolution is passed. A majority of two-thirds of total membership of the House is required. Once this resolution is passed in the first House, then it will be sent to the other House. The second House will investigate the charges made by the first House on the President. And in this second House, the President shall have the right to appear and to be represented at such investigation that is carried out in the second house. 
and based on the result of the investigation if a resolution is passed for impeachment against the president by a majority of at least two thirds of the total membership of the house then the president shall stand removed from his or her office and this is to be having effect from the date on which the resolution is passed in the second house here the second house will pass such a resolution mentioning that the charges against the president has been sustained so this is with respect to the impeachment procedure for the indian president now note that neither in the first house nor in the second house the chief justice of india is mandated by the constitution to appear so this means chief justice of india is not present in the process of impeachment of indian president whereas in the case of united states in the second house that is the trial house that is senate the chief justice is the judge there we saw that the house managers in the senate act as prosecution the senate acts as jury and the president there acts as defendant while the chief justice of supreme court of united states acts as judge and this is one of the reason as there is participation of chief justice of supreme court in these proceedings gives an understanding that there will not be a need for appeal to the supreme court in which the chief justice is also present but this is one thing we can learn from them we saw that in terms of united states there is investigation in the first house and there is trial in the second house it looks like almost uh, like a criminal case where police investigate court conducts prosecution or trial whereas according to indian constitution the first house frames the charges prefers charges against the president that is moved as a resolution the second house investigates where the president has the right to appear and if passed with the majority of two thirds of total membership of that house then the president stands removed from the date on which the resolution is passed for impeachment in the second house so these are some of the information with respect to the analysis of uh, these news articles now let's move on to the analysis of next news article this news article discusses about the open market operations which has been planned by reserve bank of india we'll discuss about bonds government securities types of government securities then open market operations and finally we'll see the importance of today's news article the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article has been highlighted here for your reference first let's see about bond a bond is simply a debt instrument that can be issued by one authority to get loan from the investor so the investor loans money to this issuing entity through the debt instrument which is bond now the entity that gets the loan amount can be private or government this entity borrows funds for a definite period of time either at variable rate of interest or fixed rate of interest from the investor who gives money or who loans money to this entity bonds are used by companies municipalities states and sovereign governments to raise money that is to get the financial capital in terms of loans with this money that is accrued through bonds they can finance projects and various activities in this case one who lends the money to the issuer of the bond they are called as owners of bonds and these owners are also called as debt holders or creditors of the issuer they are called as creditors because they give credit to the issuing authority while getting the bond as debt instrument they are not debtors they are debt holders meaning they have given debt to the issuing authority and waiting to get their money back now let's see about government securities government security is a tradable instrument that is issued by reserve bank of india on behalf of central government or the state governments a government security acknowledges the government's debt obligation for example if a person purchases a government security then the government has the obligation to pay the face value or the interest to the person who purchased the government security and that person who has government security in his or her hand he or she can trade this government security in stock exchange and that is the reason why we call it as tradable instrument see government security works on the principle or concept of bonds but there are different terminologies for gsex that are used in india if you see gsex can be short term or long term short term government securities are usually called as treasury bills their original maturity period will be less than one year long term government securities are usually called as government bonds or dated securities their maturity period will be one year or more the interest varies for different government securities depending on the type of government security 
So these are two types of government securities in India. These securities are called as government securities because the securities are issued either by central government or by state government through Reserve Bank of India. In case of central government, it issues both treasury bills and bonds or dated securities. If you see state governments, they issue only bonds or dated securities. And these bonds or dated securities that are issued by state governments through RBA are called as state development loans. And government will never default the loan which it has taken through government securities. So practically there is no risk of default. So therefore government securities are also called as risk-free guilt-edged instruments. Now let's see how these government securities are issued. See they are issued through auctions that are conducted by Reserve Bank of India. Auctions are conducted on the electronic platform called as eCubair. We know that eCubair is the core banking solution platform of RBI. See, RBI consults with Government of India and then it issues an indicative half yearly auction calendar which consists of the details of auctions. This calendar will contain the information regarding, you know, amount of borrowing, the range of the tenor, that is the time period, the maturity time period for the securities and it also has the time in which the auctions will be held. And before auctions, required information through notifications and press informations will be released by RBI. So whenever you see in the news articles or anywhere that the government is planning to buy or sell government securities, it is the RBI that does this operation on behalf of central government or the state governments. So now let's see about open market operations. See this refers to buying of government securities or selling of government securities to open market. See open market is an unrestricted market that has free access anyone can participate. And why RBI conducts open market operations that is to adjust the liquidity conditions in the market. When RBA feels that there is excess liquidity, that is when RBA feels that there is excess money in the market, it sells the government securities. While selling, it will receive the money. So the money in the open market will be absorbed by RBA. This is one method how RBA controls liquidity, thereby it also can control inflation, that is demand pull inflation. That is more money chasing less number of goods and therefore there is inflation. So how to address this? The more money in the hands of people has to be reduced by getting the money to RBI by selling government securities. Now when the liquidity conditions are tight in the open market, that is money is not available in the hands of people. When RBI buys the security, it gives back money to the open market. So there will be money in the open market, thereby it increases liquidity in the open market. Now while buying back or while repurchasing, sometimes the central government or the state governments, they buy back their existing securities that they have sold in the open market prematurely. This is called as redemption of government securities prematurely from the debt holders. Suppose the maturity period of a particular government security is 2025, but RBI on behalf of central or state governments prematurely buys it in 2020. Now what are the objectives of buyback of government securities? One main objective is to reduce the cost of particular government security. Here we are discussing about buying government securities prematurely. Usually for such operations, RBI buys back high coupon securities. When we say high coupon securities, it means that the interest rates are high. So the debt holder or the creditor will be having more return or more yield for the particular government security. So when they are getting more yield, it is increasing burden on the government. So to reduce the increasing burden or to reduce the cost of this particular government security, RBI buys back these high coupon government securities. So by this we can say that the government is managing its borrowing costs. Now when government is giving money at this time, it need not have any interest obligations in the future. So it manages its borrowing costs. Now the next objective is to reduce the number of outstanding securities and to improve liquidity in the government securities market. Then the central government also repurchases government security for effective cash management. It means that when the central government is having surplus money, it can utilize the surplus money to buy back the government securities. It actually means that central government is having money to pay its debt, so it is carrying out this document. So it is carrying out this operation through RBI. 
we also saw that this government security is actually a debt obligation of the government and why government carries out this activity one another reason is normally to infuse or to inject liquidity into the economic system usually we'll be seeing that rbi performing either buying or selling of government securities but in today's news article you can see that rbi has planned to simultaneously buy and sell government securities in a single day rbi has said that after reviewing the current liquidity and market situation and after assessing the evolving financial conditions in the country it has decided to conduct simultaneous purchase and sale of government securities under open market operations so it has decided on 23rd december 2019 it will buy government securities worth 10000 crore rupees and sell government securities worth 10000 crore rupees now you may think 10000 is same in both cases there is a difference because the rbi is going to purchase government securities with long term maturities that is those government bonds that are going to mature by the year 2029 now this purpose of buying back the long term securities is to manage the borrowing costs or the manage the yields of the investors thereby managing its own uh, borrowing commitments in the present and also in the future so what about the government securities that are to be sold by rbi on 23rd december see these government securities are going to be short term government securities that will mature in 2020 maybe in the month of april 2020 or may 2020 or june 2020 or december 2020 but it has decided to buy government securities with long term maturities that are to mature in 2029 and simply we can say that government has planned to sell treasury bills and planned to buy government bonds or dated securities This is because treasury bills are also called as short term government securities. So RBI has planned to buy and sell government securities in a single go. So the ultimate objective is to make the borrowing of government cheaper by buying back long term government securities and earning some extra money by way of selling short term government securities. In informal terms we can say it's a form of rotating the debt and earning some extra money. And the government can use this extra money for other economic activities. The news article tells that this action that is to be carried out by RBI as Operation Twist. Know that it is not an official term that has been used by RBI. Operation Twist is actually a move which was taken by US Federal Reserve, which is the Central Bank of United States. In 2011-12, it has conducted Operation Twist to make long-term borrowing cheaper for the government. US Federal Reserve carried out Operation Twist to buy back long-term bonds. using the proceeds from the sales of short term bonds it is called as uh, twist because of the twist in the usual operation these are some of the information with respect to the analysis of this news article we saw about government securities it types then about open market operation and finally we saw how rbi has planned to conduct simultaneous buying and selling of government securities now let's move on to the next news article This news article talks about uh, various developments that happened in the second India United States 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue. This 2 plus 2 dialogue was held at Washington United States on 18th December 2019. This is the second 2 plus 2 meeting between India and United States and it is the first 2 plus 2 meeting to be held in United States. In this news article discussion we'll see about four foundational agreements of USA then we'll also see the industry security annex that was signed in the recent 2 plus 2 meeting then we'll also see in brief about comcasa and information fusion center for indian ocean region the syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference according to government of india this 2 plus 2 dialogue is the highest level institutional mechanism between the two countries that provides for a review of security partnership defense partnership and strategic partnership between the two countries now the important news from this news article is that india and united states have signed the industrial security annex so what is this isa before entering into it let's see the basic foundational agreements between india and usa note that united states enter into four foundational agreements with its defense partners India is a defense partner of United States and in fact India is a major defense partner as recognized by United States in the year 2016. Now the four foundational agreements are 
the General Security of Military Information Agreement, the Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, the Communications Compatibility and Security Agreement, the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement for Geospatial Cooperation. The United States have signed the first three agreements with India. General Security of Military Information Agreement was signed in 2002. The Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement was signed in 2016. COMCASA was signed in 2018 during the first India-United States 2 plus 2 dialogue in New Delhi, India in September 2018. If you see COMCASA, this agreement was signed in 2018 but it has to be put into operation. So in this 2 plus 2 dialogue, in this second edition, both India and USA have reviewed the steps that are being taken to operationalize this foundational agreement. If you see the fourth foundational agreement, this is BECA, the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement for Geospatial Cooperation. It has not yet been signed between two countries. It is still under negotiation as both sides are trying to sort out few issues or concerns. If this agreement is signed, then India and United States, they have to share geospatial data, for example, topographical data, nautical data and aeronautical data with each other. Now let's see about the Industrial Security Annex, which is an add-on feature to this General Security of Military Information Agreement. Now the General Security of Military Information Agreement, it enables sharing of military intelligence between two countries and it requires each partner to protect the classified information of other partner. Here when we say classified information, it refers to the secret information that are in the military intelligence between two countries. Now, signing of Industrial Security Annex will now help in establishing closer defense industry cooperation and collaboration between the two countries. That is why it is called as Industrial Security Annex. See, this ISA is critical for United States defense companies to do business with Indian private industry. It will help in transfer of key high-end technology from U.S. defense companies to its Indian partners. And this will also make the state-of-the-art defense technology that is available in the United States to the Indian defense firms. So we can see that this ISA will give a boost to Indian private sector which is presently looking for a greater role in defense manufacturing. Indian Defense Minister has hoped that this Industrial Security Annex will help in smooth transfer of classified technology or secret technology and information between private companies of the United States and India. Indian Air Force is planning to expand its fleet by purchasing around some 114 fighter jets. US companies such as Boeing and Lockheed Martin, they are uh, among the bidders of this multi-billion dollar deal. Now they can tie up with Indian companies as now this ISA pact has been signed. Other than this, a U.S. military official has also said that United States is ready to offer some of the best technology that are widely used by U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force. Some of them are F-Bar A-18 Super Hornet and the bespoke F-21. Now this F-Bar A-18 Super Hornet is associated with uh, fighter aircrafts. So these are some of the information with respect to the Industrial Security Annex. We saw that COMCASA agreement was signed in 2018, but it is yet to be operationalized. See, COMCASA is an India-specific version of Communication and Information on Security Memorandum of Agreement, which United States has with other countries. It was signed between India and United States in 2018. As we saw already, this agreement is valid for a period of 10 years. Now, the special feature of this agreement is that it allows India to procure and transfer specialized equipment from United States for encrypted communications. So India can purchase and use high-end secured communication equipment for defense purposes. So this agreement, though signed in 2018, but is yet to be operationalized. So this was discussed during 2 plus 2 dialogue. Here uh, Indian Defense Minister mentioned that steps to operationalize COMCASA will be discussed in the military cooperation group meeting. So what is this military cooperation group? See, it is one of the subgroups of defense policy group, which is the primary mechanism that guides India-United States strategic defense partnership or India-United States strategic defense relationship. Top officials from both countries, they meet under this defense policy group mechanism to discuss on various defense issues and concerns.
Indian Defence Minister has said that India has sent an invitation to United States to nominate a liaison officer for the Information Fusion Centre for the Indian Ocean region, which is also shortly called as IFC IOR. See, this IFC IOR is established to strengthen maritime security in the Indian Ocean region. It will act as maritime information hub. That is why it is called as Information Fusion Centre for the Indian Ocean region. Now, this centre has been established in Gurugram near Delhi. This centre is co-located with Information Management and Analysis Centre, which means both these institutions, IFC IOR and Information Management and Analysis Centre, they are at Gurugram near Delhi. So, we saw about the four foundational agreements of USA, out of which three has been already signed with our country. And we saw about Industry Security Annex, which was signed recently between India and United States. And we saw about Comcasa and shortly about IFC IOR. This news article is about a visa fee waiver scheme that is framed by the central government in the year 2015. The syllabus that is relevant for the analysis of this news article and the syllabus that can be linked to the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. We know that thousands of uh, Sri Lankan Tamils, they have become refugees in our country because of ethnic violence and disturbed conditions in Sri Lanka since the year 1983. The three decades long conflict in Sri Lanka is called as ethnic violence and disturbed conditions by us, whereas Sri Lankan government calls it as three decades long terrorist conflict. So during that time, and even after the conclusion of the conflict, several persons have become refugees in our country. Now these persons are staying in India in two ways. A set of persons will be staying in refugee camps under the control of government. Then there are a set of refugees who stay outside the refugee camps. Now the difference is that those Sri Lankan Tamil refugees who are residing in camps, they will be provided accommodation, electricity, drinking water and toilet facilities without any cost. And they will be also given some additional facilities such as monthly cash assistance, free clothing materials, subsidized ration and some level of educational assistance is also provided. But today our focus will be on those refugees who do not have camp registration or those refugees whose camp registration has been removed or those refugees who have chosen to live outside the refugee camps. Together we can say today we'll be dealing with those refugees who live outside the refugee camps. So when such refugees who are uh, staying outside the refugee camps, when they want to return to their homeland Sri Lanka, they will be levied visa fee and also overstay penalty. Now this visa fee and overstay penalty will be applicable from the day they have been living in India without registration. Now, there is one common concern that many non-camp refugees, while shifting their residence from one place to another, in the new residence, they may not register themselves with the local police stations or they may not register themselves with appropriate authority as required under the law for a variety of reasons, though registration is a necessity. When they intend to go back to Sri Lanka, for the period they have been living here without registration, they will be levied visa fee and overstay penalty. See, according to Government of India, the financial penalty will be 300 US dollars if the overstay is even one day or if the overstay is up to 90 days. Now, if you convert this 300 US dollars to rupees, it amounts to around 21,000 rupees. And if the overstay is more than two years, then the financial penalty is 500 US dollars, which is around 35,000 rupees. Here, when we say registration, we are referring to the registration procedures for foreigners that are mentioned in the Registration of Foreigners Act of 1939 and the Registration of Foreigners Rules 1992 in accordance with various other obligations required under the Passport Entry into India Act of 1920 and the Foreigners Act of 1946. If you see Rule 7, Sub Rule 2 C of Registration of Foreigners Rules 1992, any foreigner has to present a registration report immediately after the expiry of authorized period of stay in our country. Under this registration report, they will be registering with the foreigner's regional registration officer or the foreigner's registration officer of the government. We know that the conflict came to an end in Sri Lanka in 2009. Many refugees were willing to go back to their country, willing to get their land back, willing to get their other movable and immovable properties back in their hands. This process is called as repatriation 
when this is done voluntarily it is called as voluntary repatriation c government of india encourages voluntary repatriation of sri lankan tamil refugees back to their country in this regard our government has asked the government of sri lanka to provide a conducive environment for sri lankan refugees to return to their country on a voluntary basis and as per the ministry of external affairs of government of india the government of sri lanka has been extending facilities including education to its citizens who are returning to its country after being staying as refugees in any country including our country but what happened in the process of voluntary repatriation is the refugees faced an obstacle that is they have faced some penalties and fees that are huge and some of the refugees found it difficult to manage the situation here we are not talking about those who are willingly violating the registration procedures we are talking about those refugees who had genuine reasons for the inability to adhere to various standards of documentation with reference to registration so there was a demand to the central government that at least for such refugees these penalties and visa fee can be waived in fact if you see it is a proposal from the government of tamil nadu to waive overstay penalty and visa fee for sri lankan tamil refugees who are willing to go back to their country so after looking into the proposal made by the state government of tamil nadu the central government has decided on 16th december 2015 to bring a scheme for such deserving vulnerable refugees this scheme is called as the visa fee and overstay penalty waiver for sri lankan refugee scheme the news article mentions that this scheme is framed by the ministry of home affairs so as the name implies this scheme allows to waive the visa fee and the overstay penalty for sri lankan refugees who are willing to undergo voluntary repatriation now this scheme is for those who are non camp refugees or those who stay outside the camps of the government only the registration particulars of these persons are required with respect to voluntary repatriation because they were actually not under the protection of government as the camp refugees because the registration particulars of the camp refugees are already with the government so there is no need of much documentation process with respect to camp refugees so there is no need for overstay penalty with respect to non registration so if you see the cut off date this scheme is applicable for sri lankan refugees who have come to india prior to 9th january 2015 so in a way if you see this scheme is meant for expediting the process of voluntary repatriation for non camp refugees from sri lanka thereby the scheme acts like an incentive for these refugees to return to their homeland if you see the process a refugee from sri lanka who would like to return voluntary to his or her homeland the person will be applying for the waiver then this application will be scrutinized by a committee that comprises of a secretary level officer in the state government then a police officer in the rank of inspector general then also foreigners regional registration officer of the concerned jurisdiction with respect to refugees who are staying in tamil nadu the authority will be foreigners regional registration officer chennai and here the beneficiaries will be decided based on case to case basis only and if you see the news article it mentions that since 2015-16 until recently around 27 applications were rejected after perusing or examining the individual applications so in a duration of around 4 years the author says that only around 1200 non camp refugees have got the waiver even if you see the number of applications is also very near only 27 applications were rejected but if you see the number of sri lankan uh, tamil refugees in the state of tamil nadu the number is around 35000 the article mentions some of the reasons for the limited interest or the limited response to this scheme framed by the central government the main reason is the lack of awareness here when we say lack of awareness we are meaning lack of awareness among the non camp refugees then the other reasons are uh, one is cumbersome process that is this refers to huge documentation process that is followed in the matter of voluntary repatriation with respect to various formalities and there will be some of the refugees who are in vulnerable position for example they may have genuine issues like loss of original certificates they could be elderly individuals or they could be differently able persons or those individuals who are weak in terms of legal literacy these persons may not be holding all the documents that are required for this process 
So non-availability of sufficient framework to address the concerns of these vulnerable refugees is also one of the reasons, even though they may think about repatriation, they may not come forward to apply waiver under the scheme. So with respect to this matter, while we have appropriate quantitative measures in terms of documentation, we also require qualitative measures to assess the vulnerably placed refugees. Then there are reasons such as, you know, the desire and the willingness to acquire Indian citizenship because of better conditions in India. This could be economic prospects, social aspects, safety and other aspects of our society. Then the author also mentions about recent terror incident in Sri Lanka, that is Easter blast in April. Even this is also a factor that plays in the minds of Sri Lankan refugees while considering to return to their home country. In addition to these reasons that are mentioned in the news article, what we also require is the cooperation from the government of Sri Lanka in accepting its own citizens and also accepting them duly recognizing their rights with respect to land, movable and immovable properties when those persons were living in Sri Lanka. And if you want to know the bridge between both governments, the bridge at the international level for these refugees, it is the United Nations Refugee Agency. We are talking about United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The agency is based in Geneva in Switzerland. So when we talk about India-Sri Lanka relations, voluntary repatriation is one of the points that requires cooperation between two countries. Today we have discussed about the special scheme that is crafted by the government of India in 2015 to waive the visa fee and overstay penalty for those non-camp refugees who are willing to go back to their home country. Now know that in addition to this incentive provided by government of India, government of India has constructed more than 45,000 houses in Sri Lanka, particularly in the northern and eastern provinces of Sri Lanka. And some of the houses have been constructed in central and Uwa provinces of Sri Lanka, particularly for the Indian origin Tamils. So these are some of the information with respect to the analysis of this news article. Now this question is with reference to open market operations. They have given two statements and are asking which of the above statements are incorrect. First statement, the objective is to adjust the liquidity conditions in the open market. Now this statement is correct. So whenever RBA feels that there is excess liquidity in the market, it sells government securities and it takes or contracts the money in the open market. And when liquidity conditions are tight in the open market, RBA buys securities from the market. It repays the money to the open market while buying the securities back. Now there is money in the open market, thereby there is increase in the liquidity in open market. So, so the first statement is correct. Now once you know that the first statement is correct, you can eliminate options A and C. Now the second statement, the above objective is achieved only by selling of government securities to the open market. Now this statement is incorrect. This is because when government securities are sold to the open market, the liquidity in the market will be only absorbed by RBA. Whereas the objective in the first statement mentions that to adjust the liquidity conditions. So only the second statement is incorrect. Therefore the correct answer for this question is option B, two only. Now this question is with respect to impeachment of President of India. Consider the following statements regarding impeachment of President of India. They have given two statements asking to select the correct statements from the codes given below. The first statement, only Lok Sabha can initiate charges of impeachment against the President. Now this statement is incorrect because according to Article 61, the process of impeachment for violation of the Constitution, that is the process of impeachment against the President for the violation of Constitution can be initiated by any one of the houses of parliament. It can be either Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha. In United States, it can be initiated by one house of the US Congress, that is House of Representatives. For India, either houses can initiate. So the first statement is incorrect. So once the first statement is incorrect, you can eliminate option A and option C. The second statement, the impeachment resolution will get passed in a house only if it gets two third majority or more of the total membership of that house. This statement is correct. So the correct answer for this question is option B, two only. Now see this question. Consider the following treasury bills, government bonds, dated securities. Which of the above are long term government securities? See, we are telling government securities as short term or long term based on the maturity period. If the maturity period is less than one year, it is called short term government securities, which is also called as 
ട്രഷറി ബിൽസ് ഹിയർ ദ ക്വസ്റ്റൻ ഇസ് അബൌട്ട് ലോങ് ടേം ഗവൺമെൻറ് സെക്യൂരിറ്റീസ് വൺസ് യു നോ ട്രഷറി ബിൽസ് ഓർ ഷോർട്ട് ടേം ഗവൺമെൻറ് സെക്യൂരിറ്റീസ് യു ക്യാൻ എലിമിനേറ്റ് ഓപ്ഷൻ എ ആൻഡ് ഓപ്ഷൻ ബി ജനറലി ലോങ് ടേം ഗവൺമെൻറ് സെക്യൂരിറ്റീസ് ആർ ഓൾസോ കോൾഡ് എസ് ഗവൺമെൻറ് ബോണ്ട്സ് ആൻഡ് ഡേറ്റഡ് സെക്യൂരിറ്റീസ് they are called as long term government securities because they have maturity period of 1 year or more than 1 year so the correct answer for this question is option c 2 and 3 only now this question is with reference to industrial security annex which is an add on agreement of general security of military information agreement the question asks that isa which is often seen in news is a pact signed between india and which of the following countries so the correct answer is option d united states of america See US has four foundational agreements with its defense partners. India is a major defense partner as recognized by USA in the year 2016. It has signed three foundational agreements with India. They are General Security of Military Information Agreement, Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, Communications Compatibility and Security Agreement, but it has not yet signed the Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement for Geospatial Cooperation. So the correct answer for this question is option D. With this we come to the end of today's the Hindu news analysis. If you like the video click the like button, comment, share and subscribe to Shankar Reddy's Academy YouTube channel for more updates and content on civil service exam preparation. We really apologize for the delay in publishing this video. Thank you for your support. See you tomorrow.